Welcome to Lecture 28 of Electrical Circuits 1. In this lecture, at the beginning of the lecture, I'm going to do a brief review of what we did last time, talking about frequency domain circuit analysis. And we mentioned superposition last time, but today I want to hit that a little bit harder and do an example of superposition because we're going to be building on superposition for the next couple of lectures. The new topics this time are characterizing systems directly in the frequency domain and creating what is called a frequency response. Associated educational materials are in sections 2.7.4, 2.7.5, and 2.8.0. Now I want to emphasize at this point that when we move from frequency domain circuit analysis to system characterization in the frequency domain, we're not going to really be doing anything terribly new. What we're going to be changing is our mindset about how we look at a circuit. So when I do examples in here, I'll tend to do the same example over and over again with minor variations and build toward our final result. Then next lecture around, we'll take that final result and do some more varied examples about creating a frequency response. A very brief review of what we are doing relative to frequency domain analysis. And this can be very brief because everything that we're doing here is essentially what we were doing with resistive circuits for about the first quarter to the first third of the course. So the analysis techniques used in the time domain for specifically resistive networks are also applicable in general to the frequency domain analysis of more general circuits, circuits that do contain energy storage elements. Remember in the time domain when we moved from resistive networks to circuits with energy storage elements, inductors and capacitors, we went from algebraic equations to differential equations. Now when we are doing only frequency domain analysis where we're only interested in the steady state sinusoidal response of the circuit, those differential equations became algebraic equations again. The drawback or the complexity was that we had to deal with some complex arithmetic. We have imaginary numbers now. That's a relatively minor penalty compared to solving differential equations. Now when we do this, we can take all of our circuit analysis techniques in the time domain, KVL, KCL, circuit reduction, nodal analysis, mesh analysis, superposition, Thevenin's and Norton's theorems. Those apply directly to the frequency domain analysis of circuits with energy storage elements. In order to do that, what we typically do is substitute impedances for resistances. So the resistances that we used in the first part of the course become impedances, they are now complex values in general. We also have to use phasor voltage and currents in place of the time domain voltage and currents that we used for purely resistive networks. So now the phasors representing voltage and currents are also complex numbers. The difference between the phasors and the impedances is that the phasors are describing a sinusoidally varying waveform. Okay, phasors specifically are associated with a sinusoid. Impedances are just a complex number. They don't relate back to a sinusoidal function. Now in the last lecture, I mentioned superposition briefly. I want to review what I mentioned, and then I'm going to do some examples. Now this becomes really important, superposition in the frequency domain. It's going to be the key to understanding a whole new approach towards analyzing and understanding circuits. Superposition in the frequency domain. If you have multiple signals with different frequencies, the only valid way you can analyze that circuit in the frequency domain is to use superposition. Remember that the impedances depend upon the frequency. So if your signals are at different frequencies, the impedances that those signals are seeing are different. Okay? It's essentially a different circuit in the frequency domain when you have different frequencies. So you can't just lump everything together. You have to analyze each source independently. OK, so each source can be analyzed independently in the frequency domain, but you cannot necessarily superimpose or add up the contributions from these different sources directly in the frequency domain. In general, you have to go back to the time domain to actually superimpose those contributions. Now one special case that's not really of very much interest is if all the sources have the same frequency, then all the impedances 
Okay, they'll all be the same value. You can superimpose those directly in the frequency domain, but frankly, that's not a terribly interesting case to me. Now, our first example is we want to determine the steady state voltage V of T across this inductor in this circuit. I have two forcing functions in this circuit. I have a current source, which is 6 cosine of 9T amperes, so it has a frequency of 9 radians per second. I also have a voltage source, which is 4 cosine of 3T plus 30 degrees volts. This guy has a frequency of 3 radians per second. Now, I can use superposition in the time domain to analyze this circuit. I can kill one of the sources and analyze the response of V of T to the other source, then just swap, kill the other source, analyze V of T to this source. So I'll end up with two circuits. So I'll have a circuit with only the current source, 6 cosine of 9T, a 1 ohm resistor, this one-third Henry inductor. This is the contribution V1 of T to V of T due to this source only. Then I kill the other source. Here's my three ohm resistor. A voltage source when it's killed becomes a short circuit. Now I can kill this source, analyze the circuit's response to the voltage source. Killing a current source results in an open circuit. I still have this one ohm resistor. I will now have a contribution to this voltage, which is going to be V2 of T, which is the result due to this second source. I have a three ohm resistor. This is a one third Henry inductor. And I need to preserve my voltage source for cosine of 3t plus 30 degrees. Then I can analyze each circuit separately, and v of t is equal to v1 of t plus v2 of t. Now what I want to actually do with this is analyze these in the frequency domain. So I'm going to take each of these circuits, transfer them over to the frequency domain, create a phasor version of this, replace resistances with impedances, and find V1 as a phasor. Then I'll do the same process for V2. Then I will superimpose those to find V of T, but I will not be able to add the phasors directly because the frequencies are different. So on the next slide, let's take a look at the phasor versions of these and determine phasors for V1 and phasors for V2. When I convert my previous time domain circuits to the frequency domain, I end up with this circuit and this circuit. For the current source, the current source is a phasor is 6 at an angle of 0 degrees amperes. Resistances transfer directly over to impedances. The impedance of this inductor is J omega times L. The frequency for this source is 9 radians per second. That becomes a J3 ohms. And my voltage across this inductor is V1 as a phasor now. When I've killed my current source, my voltage source is 4 at an angle of 30 degrees volts. This now has a frequency of 3 radians per second. So the impedance of this inductor is J1 ohms. Again, the resistors do not change. They are not a function of frequency. The V2 as a phasor is just V2. Now we can find V1 and V2 independently. I think you've seen enough of these now that you can have a chance to go ahead and do this on your own, get a little bit of practice working in the frequency domain, then come back and I'll do it, and then we'll go ahead and superimpose the results on the next slide. The circuit on the left, to me, looks like a current divider. I have a current, 6 at an angle of 0 degrees, going into a parallel combination of two impedances. So if I want to find the current as a phasor I1, I1 is the total current, 6 at an angle of 0 degrees, times the other impedance, which is 3 ohms, over the sum of these two impedances, 3 plus J3 ohms. If I do this complex arithmetic, it turns out that I1 is equal to 
6 over square root of 2 and an angle of minus 45 degrees amperes. Now I have the current, I have the impedance, that will give me V1 directly. So V1 is I1 times this impedance, J3 ohms, which is 6 over square root 2, angle minus 45 degrees, times J3 is 3 at an angle of 90 degrees. So 3 times 6 is 18 over square root 2, which is 9 times the square root of 2 at an angle, multiplying magnitudes, adding phases, 90 minus 45 is 45 degrees. This is my phaser for V1. Now I can go ahead and determine the phaser for V2. This is an open circuit. No current goes through this. Therefore, I can ignore this leg of this circuit. The rest of this looks like a voltage source in series with two impedances. That looks like a voltage divider. So this voltage, V2, is equal to this impedance, J1 ohms, over the sum of the two impedances, 3 plus J1 ohms, times the total voltage across them, 4 at an angle of 30 degrees. If I do the complex arithmetic here, I end up with 4 over square root 10 at an angle of 101.6 degrees. Now we've got the phasers for V1 and V2. I now need to superimpose those results to get the total voltage across the inductor. I cannot superimpose these directly in the frequency domain. I can't add the phasers V1 and V2 because the inputs are not at the same frequency. Remember, you're now in the frequency domain. You don't see any time information. You no longer know what the frequency is associated with this. It was on the previous slide. However, there are different frequencies. This impedance changed. You're no longer even analyzing really the same circuit in the frequency domain. You can't add up these results directly. You have to convert them back to the time domain and then add them. Now let's superimpose our previous results to get the overall voltage across the inductor. I said that V1 is 9 times square root of 2 at an angle of 45 degrees. Therefore, V1 is a function of time is this amplitude, 9 times square root of 2, cosine of the frequency which doesn't show up in this phaser, but it was 9 radians per second times t plus this phase angle. V2 as a phaser was 4 over square root of 10 at an angle of 101.6 degrees. In the time domain, V2 of t becomes this amplitude, 4 over square root of 10, cosine of this frequency was 3 radians per second, so that's a 3t plus 101.6 degrees. Now I can superimpose these. I could not directly add these except in the special case where they're both resulting from an input that's at the same frequency. So adding these up, V of t is V1 of t, 9 times square root of 2, cosine of 9t plus 45 degrees, plus 4 over the square root of 10, cosine of 3t plus 101.6 degrees. That's our final result. Notice that our output has components at 9 radians per second and 3 radians per second, each independent frequency input results in an output at the same frequency. Now I want to make a couple of quick comments about superposition. Superposition in steady state sinusoidal analysis is very important. It's an extremely powerful tool. In later courses, not in this one, but you'll find out that almost any signal that varies as a function of time can be represented as a superposition of sinusoidal signals. And the appropriate analysis techniques to do that representation are called Fourier series and Fourier transforms. We obviously won't get into those here, but we, I want to indicate the power of this approach. Okay, we're now to the stage where 
if we represent an arbitrary signal as a superposition of sinusoidal signals, we can go to the frequency domain, analyze the circuit's response to each of those individual signals, then we sum up those responses. We have the ability now to determine the circuit's response to nearly any arbitrary input signal. When we're solving differential equations, we did natural response, we did step response, and then we kind of gave up. This is a backdoor approach towards getting to an arbitrary input signal. So we're going to spend the next couple lectures looking at circuit responses to multiple sinusoidal inputs. We'll see where that leads us. That will lead us to what is called the frequency response. Now quite often, you'll use the frequency response to directly interpret the circuit's behavior rather than doing the transformation back to the time domain. That's how useful this is. The design specifications will often be presented in terms of the frequency response, how the circuit behaves to individual frequency inputs. Now let's do another example. I have an RC circuit here with two voltage sources. I want to determine the voltage across the capacitor resulting from these two voltage sources. And Vs1 of t is going to be 3 cosine 2t plus 20 degrees. And Vs2 of t is going to be 5 cosine 2t minus 45 degrees. A couple things I want to point out. At the moment, these guys are at the same frequency. Okay? I'm going to revisit this example several times, changing Vs1 and Vs2 to get things more general at the moment. I'm going to keep the frequencies the same. Now, remember that voltage sources in series add directly. This circuit looks like a single source where the source voltage is Vs1 plus Vs2 with a resistor and a capacitor. The resistance is always 2 ohms. This capacitance is 0.25 farads. My frequency in both cases is 2t, so 1 over j omega c is just 1 over j times 2 times 0.25, which is minus 2j ohms. So this is 0.5. When the j goes in the numerator, I pick up a minus sign. Dividing top and bottom by 0.5 gives me the 2. So both of these inputs will both see the same impedance. Okay, let's go to the next slide and actually do the analysis for this. Now, as I noted on the previous slide, as long as my input frequency was 2 radians per second, the impedance of the circuit did not change. The capacitor's impedance was always minus J2 ohms. The resistor's impedance is independent of frequency. So what I'm going to do here is do a little trick to make this example go more quickly. I'm going to take an arbitrary input, V sub s. The only thing that I know about this is it has a frequency of 2 radians per second. I'm going to leave its amplitude and its phase angle as variables. I'm not going to specify what those are. I need to specify its frequency because I need that frequency to specify this impedance. So now I'm going to look at the output phaser resulting from an arbitrary input phaser with a frequency of 2 radians per second. I have a series combination of impedances with a voltage specified across it. This looks like a voltage divider. So V as a phaser is this impedance minus J2 ohms over the sum of these two impedances, 2 minus J2 ohms times the total voltage across the series combination, which is just V sub s. The only thing that we know about it is it has this frequency. If I divide top and bottom by minus J2 ohms, uh, the numerator becomes 1. 2 over negative J2 is just J. Uh, negative J2 over negative J2 is 1. So I get voltage output as a phaser is 1 over 1 plus J times V sub s, this is just 1 at an angle of 0 degrees over the square root of 1 squared plus 1 squared is the square root of 2. This guy here is at 45 degree phase angle times V sub s. So I know now that V is going to be 
1 over square root of 2 at an angle of 0 minus 45 degrees times whatever voltage phasor I put in here. Now I've got a relationship directly between the input and the output. Any voltage phasor that I put in here, I multiply its magnitude by 1 over square root of 2. That gives me the magnitude of the output. I add negative 45 degrees to its phase angle to get the phase angle of the output. So I can plug any sinusoidal signal in here as long as it has a frequency of 2 radians per second, and the result just pops out without reanalyzing the circuit. On the next slide, let's take a look at what the response is to the two actual physical inputs that we have. Now let's use the results of our little trick to find the circuit's response to both of our inputs. I said that any output is just the input as a phasor times this complex number. Keep that in mind. I'm taking a complex number, I'm multiplying it by another complex number to get this complex number. The product of two complex numbers is the output. For our first input, Vs1 as a phasor was 3 at an angle of 20 degrees. Therefore, V1 as a phasor is the product. If I plug this in here, I multiply the magnitudes. That's 3 over square root of 2. I add the phases at an angle of 20 minus 45 is minus 25 degrees. My second input, Vs2 is 5 at an angle of minus 45 degrees. I can just take this, plug it in here. The amplitude of the output, V2, is equal to the product of the amplitudes of Vs and this complex number, which is going to be 5 over square root of 2. And I add the phase angles. Minus 45 minus and minus 45 degrees is minus 90 degrees. Okay, then I can transfer those both into the time domain. Okay, so V1 of t is something and V2 of t is something. Add those up to get the total voltage. Since they're the same frequency, I can actually add them in the frequency domain, but I'd like you to stay in the frame of mind where you add time domains and you keep the frequency domain version separate. I don't want to go through that because it's a fairly simple process. We've seen it already. My previous example leads to a very important result. The steady state sinusoidal response of a circuit for some frequency, omega naught, this is a specific frequency, can be characterized by two values. There's a gain. There's an output to input amplitude ratio. There is also a phase difference. It's the difference between the output and the input phases. In block diagram form, what we have is that if we have some input in phasor form and some output in phasor form, what we're doing now is representing the circuit as a complex number. That complex number gives me the ratio of the output amplitude to the input amplitude. Remember, we multiplied the input amplitude times the magnitude of the complex number representing this circuit to get this output amplitude. And the phase difference the input phase angle added to the phase angle of the complex number representing this circuit resulted in the output phase angle. We don't need to know specifically what the input amplitude and phase angle are. We have characterized the circuit as a complex number. Terminology-wise, the gain of the circuit is the ratio between B and A. So B is equal to the circuit's gain times A. The phase of the circuit is the difference between the output and the input phase. So theta plus the phase angle of the circuit gives you phi. Now let's take a look at our same circuit. I have my same capacitor and my same resistor. They're both in series. They're in series with a pair of voltage sources. What I'm going to do is generalize this slightly and apply different frequencies with these two voltage sources. Vs1 of t is 3 cosine of 2t plus 30 degrees. It's got a frequency of 2 radians per second. Vs2 of t is 5 cosine 4t plus 60 degrees. It's got a frequency of 4 radians per second. 
So if I want to do this from a superposition standpoint, I need to draw two different circuits. So Vs1 as a phasor becomes a resistor with a resistance of 2 ohms. A capacitor has a capacitance of 1 over J omega C. For Vs1, omega is 2 radians per second. This becomes 1 over two, J times 2 times 0 0.25. Uh, this is 0.5, so this is 2 over J is the impedance of this capacitor at 2 radians per second. I now have a second source, Vs2, as a phasor. The resistor has the same impedance. It's just 2 ohms. The capacitor's impedance is now 1 over J omega C is 1 over J times. My frequency is now 4 radians per second. My capacitance is 0.25, which is 1 over 4. So this has an impedance of 1 over J. I can analyze these two circuits individually, superimpose the results, and get my result. However, I kind of like the trick that I did last time. I'd rather only analyze a circuit once. It's really the same circuit, right? It's just the frequency that's making this impedance change. So let's see if we can try another trick where we can just analyze the circuit once and then interpret the result for each of these input voltages separately. In our previous example, we did a little trick in which we characterized the overall circuit for a specific frequency. Then any inputs with that frequency could be analyzed directly, just mathematically, without reanalyzing the circuit. I want to extend that trick a little bit with this example. What I'm going to do is characterize the circuit's gain and phase as a function of frequency. Both of my previous circuits that I wrote over here had a capacitor impedance of 1 over J omega C. The fact that the omega changed made those impedances different. However, there's no rule that says I can't use omega as an independent variable. I can characterize this circuit for any frequency I want. I'll just leave my impedance 1 over j omega times my capacitance was 0.25 farads just becomes 4 over j omega. This impedance is now written in terms of the frequency. Now I can take any input phasor that can actually be a function of frequency. And I can get an output phasor directly by plugging in the correct frequency here. Let's characterize this circuit leaving omega as a variable. So this still looks like a voltage divider. So V of J omega as a phasor is this impedance 4 over J omega over the sum of the two impedances, 2 plus 4 over j omega. That multiplies whatever phasor I want to put into this. Now my notation is a little bit awkward because these phasors don't actually have a frequency in them. They're simply a magnitude and a phase. But I want to emphasize that they can change for different frequencies. There's no rule that says these guys are the same for all frequencies. Now I can multiply top and bottom by j omega. This becomes 4 over 4 plus j2 omega times v sub s of j omega. So this guy here is now simply a complex number. And it's a function of frequency. If you tell me what frequency you want to analyze this circuit for, I'll convert this to a complex number. That will give me a gain and a phase for that frequency. You then tell me what phasor is associated with the input at that frequency. I'll multiply this magnitude by this amplitude and add the phases, and I'll give you the output at that frequency. You want to analyze the circuit to a different input? No problem. Tell me what the frequency is. That'll give me a different complex number here. So I'll have a different gain and phase for a different frequency. 
but it's still just a complex number. I can multiply this complex number times this phasor to get the output. My notation is going to be that I'm going to call this a function h of j omega. It has some magnitude and some phase angle. If I want the output, I multiply the magnitude of this h of j omega times the magnitude of the input and add the phase of this to the phase of this. Let's go ahead and do that for our specific circuit now. Now let's use our trick to determine the circuit's response to both of the inputs that we're applying to these. Our frequency response, h of j omega, is the ratio between the output voltage as a phasor to the input voltage as a phasor. We determined that that was 4 over 4 plus j2 times omega. Remember that this is now a function of frequency. If we apply a voltage to this of 3 cosine 2t plus 30 degrees, v sub s becomes 3 at an angle of 30 degrees. H of j omega is just h of j 2. We've chosen omega to be 2 radians per second. All I do is substitute omega equal to 2 in here. 4 plus j 4. 2 times 2 is 4. This is uh, 1 over root 2 at an angle of minus 45 degrees. So my output voltage, V1, is the multiplication of the amplitudes, 3 over square root 2, and the sum of the phases. Angle of 30 minus 45 degrees is minus 15 degrees. Now we can take a look at the second input in the same way. If my input is 5 cosine of 4t plus 60 degrees, this becomes 5 at an angle of 60 degrees. My frequency is 4. If I plug a 4 in here, h of j4 is 4 over 4 plus j8. This turns out to be 1 over the square root of 5 at an angle of minus 63.4 degrees. So using both of these, my output V2 is the product of the amplitudes. 5 over square root of 5 is square root of 5, and the sum of the phases. It's at an angle of minus 3.4 degrees. Now I can take both of these phasor outputs, convert them to the time domain, and superimpose them. Again, that step's fairly simple. I don't really want to go through that here. This approach towards analyzing circuits is really, really important and really, really useful. We can characterize the steady state response of a circuit by its frequency response, h of j omega, the gain and the phase difference introduced by the circuit as a function of frequency. Now, a little bit of nomenclature here. The frequency response is an official term. It is this complex number as a function of frequency. Keep in mind that h of j omega is a complex function of frequency. Now, it has a magnitude and a phase. Each of those have their own term. The magnitude response is the magnitude of this, so the output to input amplitude ratio, so the amplitude of the output divided by the amplitude of the input as a function of frequency. The phase response is the difference between the output and the input phases. Okay, It's the phase change that's introduced by this frequency response. In block diagram form, this looks like this. I have some input. It's generally a phaser. It's going to depend on frequency. And in fact, it may be defined at more than one frequency. When we had voltage sources in series, the overall input was the sum of the inputs at the individual frequencies. Our circuit is represented by the frequency response, which is a complex number, which is a function of frequency. It consists of a magnitude as a function of frequency, the magnitude response, and the phase as a function of frequency, the phase response. The output is simply the product in the frequency domain between h of j omega and the input.
few quick comments relative to frequency response. In the time domain, we characterized our systems by a differential equation in general. Okay, if we had energy storage elements, we ended up with a differential equation relating the input and output. We called that the input-output equation. Okay, it related the input and the output to our system. Its corresponding thing in the frequency domain is the frequency response. In the frequency doma domain, systems are generally characterized by their frequency response. As I said earlier, the magnitude and the phase response are contained within the frequency response. They give the gain and the phase difference relating the input and output as a function of frequency. So the frequency of the signal, rather than time, is now essentially our independent variable. We're looking at the system's response, the phase response and the magnitude response, as a function of frequency. It turns out that that's a really useful approach. It's very natural to people. We tend to have our senses operate in terms of frequencies. Colors are a frequency of an oscillating wavelength of light. Sound is a tone. It's an os oscillation of a pressure wave at a particular frequency. This is fairly natural to us. It's also mathematically extremely convenient in that differential equations are difficult to deal with, especially if your input signal is arbitrary. The frequency response is an algebraic relationship. You just multiply the frequency response times the input to get the output. Okay? So it's easier to deal with algebraic equations rather than differential equations. And, and as I said previously, we'll find out in later courses that virtually any signal can be represented as a superposition of sinusoids. So we can use the frequency response to analyze each of those sinusoidal components independently and then re-superimpose them. And quite often, frequency response is so important that we never really worry about the time domain signals associated with it. Our design criteria may be specified directly in the frequency domain. This concludes lecture 28. We covered a lot of territory in this lecture. We started out with our frequency domain analysis of phasers. We were analyzing the responses to specific sinusoidal inputs. And we've gone all the way to frequency responses, which is analyzing or characterizing an entire system as a function of frequency. So now we can deal with the system regardless of what the frequency of the input and the output is. And as I said previously, quite often it's the frequency response of the system itself that will be interesting to us rather than any specific input or any specific output. Because once we've characterized the system as a function of frequency, we have a pretty good idea of what that system's going to do to some forcing function in order to provide the output. So next lecture around, we'll primarily do more examples of calculating a frequency response of a circuit. We'll also see that frequency responses are generally presented graphically. The magnitude response and the phase response are generally graphically presented as functions of frequency. That makes it fairly intuitive as to what's going on. We'll take a look at graphical representations of frequency responses next time around as well.